Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar. I believe it's the first one that uh, we are having in 2021. So again, uh, very welcome. The topic today is a case study where we used the conceptual and numerical models to support the development of strategies for uh, aquifer management. So just a quick word about uh, water services and technologies uh, before we start. Uh, so we are a consulting company, uh, so we provide uh, consulting services, and we also uh, represent some product lines, and we provide uh, training courses. Part of these uh, training courses segment is our initiatives, such as the webinar today. So on the services part, we work for uh, these industries uh, that you can see on the screen. A lot of what we do is for the mining industry. But then we also uh, work uh, with uh, water supply related projects and also with the sourcing of um, water or, or groundwater uh, for the uh, beverage sector, as well as working for the industry in general. And then in our products, which would be our uh, technology part, we represent two lines of software, uh, one uh, which are hydrogeological application software developed by Waterloo Hydrogeologic. Uh, where we have modeling software, uh, the visual mod flow, Flex, and Aquifer test, which is used for interpreting, well, pumping tests and uh, slug tests and Aquifer tests in general. We also work with the Hydrogeo Analyst, which is a database, and AquaCam, which is used for interpreting uh, chemistry data. And more recently, we have some official distributors for uh, Soil Vision, uh, uh, or for Bentley software and, and Soil Vision, which has a, a whole family of uh, software applications for hydrogeologic and geotechnics. And we also uh, represent in Brazil Anessi, which is a company that develops data loggers, uh, the diver family, so to say, which are the ones that you, you can see on the screen and, and which can be used for monitoring pressure, uh, temperature, and electrical conductivity. And we also work with uh, implementing remote monitoring systems uh, using solutions such as these ones uh, called uh, diver nets. Okay, getting into the topic of today's uh, talk. So I'll just start with uh, some general numbers about uh, um, the water uh, supply and availability context in Brazil, uh, especially for those who are, do not live in Brazil. So these are just uh, uh, bulk numbers for water consumption in 2017, which reached uh, about 10,000 millions of cubic meters in one year. Most of that water was sourced from uh, surface water bodies, rivers, lakes, etc. And about 20% uh, of that consumption uh, was sourced uh, from groundwater, which is this bar that we see here is just a proportion between uh, surface water abstraction and groundwater abstraction uh, in Brazil. And the second chart just shows uh, the, uh, the volumes of uh, groundwater consumed in different states. So what, essentially what this tells is that there are states such as Sao Paulo, which are heavily dependent on groundwater. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, states, including uh, Rio de Janeiro, which are uh, much less dependent on groundwater for their water supply. So if we look at the total amount of groundwater that is extracted from aquifers uh, in Brazil, then uh, this volume would be enough, as we've seen, to actually supply the entire uh, Brazilian population. Of course, most of the groundwater that is abstracted is not used for human consumption, but then for other industrial uses and irrigation and, and other uses. Uh, from the countries, about 5,500 municipalities, about 1,500 that are supplied with surface water, they have experienced uh, water shortages in the past 10 years against uh, about 840, or let's say almost half, that have been supplied by groundwater. Just to make the point that uh, cities which are rely on groundwater tend to have less uh, problems 
with uh, uh, seasonal variations uh, due to droughts and things like that. The other point uh, in uh, Brazil is um, there is quite a, an issue associated with the uh, sewage uh, collection and treatment uh, in the country. And leakage from these, uh, these sewage uh, pipe networks is estimated to be in this order of 580 million cubic meters a year. But the result of this is that uh, pretty much all cities in Brazil, especially the main and the larger cities, uh, they have issues uh, with uh, contamination from uh, sewage uh, leakage. Usually we see that from nitrate concentrations in the groundwater. Another point that uh, this study that uh, was published in 2019 indicates is that almost 90% of the existing wells in Brazil are not known to the government agencies, so they are not in any uh, public database. In other words, uh, it's very easy, and, and we are going to, to see that. Uh, in general, it's, it's actually very uh, hard to estimate the actual groundwater consumption simply because a lot of these wells, uh, usually the shallower ones, are just not known to the uh, public agencies. Another point still about the context of uh, water supply and consumption in, in Brazil, about 35 million Brazilians, so uh, that would be about 15% of the population in Brazil does not have access to public water supply, and, uh, and they depend, they tend to depend heavily on groundwater. And again, looking at the universe of municipalities in Brazil, about 50% depends uh, eat either totally, in this case, 36% of the municipalities, or partially 16% on groundwater for the public uh, supply. So that's sort of to set the scene for topic uh, and, and the study that uh, we are going to discuss today. So this study was carried out in this uh, sedimentary base called the uh, Reconcavo. And this is in the state of Bahia. And here on the right side, we have this map of Brazil with all the main sort of uh, hydrogeological domains that exist in the country. So for instance, this green area here, this light green polygon here, indicates the extents of the Guarani aquifer in Brazil. And of course, it, it enters the neighboring countries, mainly Paraguay and, uh, and Argentina, and also Uruguay. And our area is, just north of Salvador, again in the Bahia States, is, it's just by the coast, well, in relative terms. And, and this, is, uh, this is a system of coastal sedimentary uh, basins, uh, which were deposited as part of a, a, a large rifting process that occurred here around the Jurassic. So the scope of uh, the study that we carried out for this area so the Reconcavo sedimentary basin. It included data collection, analysis and validation, the development of a conceptual, a hydrogeological conceptual model, and a numerical flow and trust transport model. And of course, calibration of this model, sensitivity analysis, and also the simulations of uh, future water consumption scenarios. As part of that, we also had two workshops uh, during this study to present uh, results and discuss uh, with uh, interested parties that uh, took, that participated in those uh, workshops. And in the end, there is this aspect of uh, technology transfer to Embaza. So Embaza is the company that provides water supply and, and sewage collection and treatment to the majority of the state of Bahia. So the, the study was an initiative from Embaza and it was funded by uh, ICA, which is an international development agency associated with the organization of the American states and also uh, the Brazilian Agency for uh, Cooperation. So what were the project uh, expectations uh, of studying this large aquifer in Bahia? So in general terms, uh, some of the expectations were to, ass to assess and quantify the aquifer potential. That means looking at the groundwater reserves to uh, quantify water availability uh, versus water demand. So here we have this sort of planning factor. And also the idea here was also to bring to light the importance of 
you know, this type of study looking at uh, regional aquifers in the task and monitoring in the task of uh, effectively uh, managing groundwater resources. And the idea also was that, uh, you know, this study could, uh, may be used by government agencies either on developing, you know, better criteria for groundwater abstraction permitting and surely for the local management of these uh, groundwater uh, resources. So looking a bit more closely in our study area, so again, uh, Salvador is here, is the, the, is the city here at this uh, tip, and, and the polygon uh, shows our study area with the Atlantic Ocean right here on the southeast. And the, the green dots that we see here are basically the wells that uh, have been surveyed by the government and uh, that are part of a uh, national database that is available with regards to groundwater um, abstraction. Another characteristic of the study area is highly variable uh, rainfall. So what we see here are isolines of precipitation. So let's say that in Salvador, the precipitation, the average precipitation, mean annual precipitation is about 800 uh, millimeters. But then as you move north, those precipitation rates, they decrease uh, fairly quickly. So if we look at Salvador then, the mean annual precipitation, like I said, is actually in the order of uh, almost 1900 millimeters. But if we move 100 kilometers to the north, to the city of Alagoinhas, where there is another rainfall station, then that precipitation is actually in the order of uh, 1,000 millimeters uh, per annum. So, you know, we can see that there is a, a pretty steep uh, decrease in precipitation rates from south to north uh, in this region. Talking about then the geological context, so the Reconcavo sedimentary basin is uh, this one here at the south of, uh, uh, of this sort of large sedimentary basin complex. We, we have sediments from uh, the Reconcavo and then we have four other areas of uh, large sediment deposition around this, uh, uh, going up this structure that uh, forms a hemi uh, system that covers then from, from the area where Salvador is all the way to the Alagoas state which is the next one here in, in the north and up to this uh, Jatoba basin. So these five, let's say, sedimentary basins form then this, uh, what is called the Reconcavo Tucano Jatoba uh, rift. And these were formed essentially during the transition from the Cretaceous to the Jurassic period about 150 million years, years ago. One interesting point is, is really that all the, uh, these areas, they have a lot of sandy, uh, sandstone uh, formations. And uh, these sandstone formations, uh, which we'll see, uh, form one major aquifer called uh, San Sebastião. They are very productive in terms of groundwater. So the, deeper, the deepest wells here, they are in the order of 500 to 600 meters. But then we can get like flow rates that exceed uh, 400 cubic meters an hour. So just as an example, uh, this on the right is a well, a, a tube well that was uh, drilled uh, within our study area. And, and this one yielded about uh, 300 cubic meters an hour. And this is just a, a sort of an average uh, well in the region. So it you know, just gives an idea of the potential for groundwater abstraction in the region. Uh, still on the geological context, then, uh, if we look at the basin in, uh, in cross-section, uh, well, roughly from west to east or from northwest to the coast in the southeast. So here we can see that uh, hemigraben uh, type structure, you know, with a lot of faulting uh, developed along the basin. And with the main aquifer of interest for our study, represented here in yellow, which is the San Sebastian aquifer, the thickness at the center of this basin or the depot center of this basin can reach up to seven kilometers and the San Sebastian aquifer can reach down to about 1500 to 2000 meters deep in depth. So 
the hydrogeological context that we have then, we, we have a, a large area, which actually takes most of the study area, where this San Sebastian formation outcrops. And above it, we have a, a, a smaller unit, uh, which is called the uh, Marizal formation. And we have some, some sandy sediments from this Bajetas group, which are represented here in yellow, and then quaternary sediments. So the, if we group these together, the São Sebastião, uh, Marizal, and uh, Barreiras, then we have what we call the São Sebastião Marizal Aquifer System, which is then the main source for groundwater, not only in the Reconcavo Basin, but also uh, moving north towards the Tucano, the Tucano Basin. So this is, we are just looking at it in, in surface here. So one of the things that uh, we had to look to to start with really was the regional geology. So uh, what do we see here is our study area highlighted here by this uh, yellow polygon. We were lucky in this, in this study, in this particular study, that um, in about 2006, there was a study carried out by a professor from the Federal University of uh, Bahia using data from Petrobras, the national oil company. He, he developed 23 cross-sections oriented uh, northwest to southeast, uh, intercepting all these areas. This would be the, sort of the Tucano sedimentary basin domain, but uh, we have about nine of these cross-sections that actually cross our, our study area. What's interesting about this study is that uh, he used the data from oil exploration wells, especially uh, geophysical logs, such as uh, spontaneous potential, to map not only the contacts between these units, the, the geological units, but also the variation in salinity of the groundwater. So, in other words, he was able to interpret the transition zone from fresh water, which occupies let's say, the upper part of this aquifer system, to the saline water, which dominates uh, the deeper parts of the, of the sedimentary basin. So from these sections, uh, we can actually come up uh, uh, with an estimate of uh, uh, fresh water uh, uh, reserves in this region. And as a matter of fact, if we, if we had looked at the entire area, uh, we could have done that estimate for this sedimentary basin as well, which is the Tucano, Tucano Basin. So, so this was a pretty important part of our conceptual model because usually in hydrogeology, we tend to work with data from uh, water wells and they, these tend to be uh, fairly uh, restricted. But uh, in this case, we, had, we were able to use data also from uh, oil wells. So the database uh, that we had then for uh, this study, we had the regional geological map from the Brazilian Geological Survey. We had these uh, regional cross sections and they went down to, to, to a depth of 2000 meters. And also data from the oil exploration wells that were used to develop those cross sections. And then over 500 wells or, or tube wells or pumping wells that uh, have been surveyed and uh, that exist in the region. So these are all, let's say, water wells. And in our study area specifically, they go down to about a depth of uh, 420 meters. So that's a big difference uh, when we look at the depth that uh, we can get information from these deeper oil wells. So we started by developing a 3D geological model using this software, uh, GeoModeler. We are going to see, but basically we started from those nine uh, regional cross sections that we had from that study. So our geological model goes also down to uh, 2000 meter depth. Uh, so this, this was, let's say the, the first main in source of input that we had in the model. And then of course we have the wells. So the, the deeper ones here, these would be the oil wells. And the shallower ones up here, these would be the water wells. And the colors just represent the different uh, geological units. So our aquifer of interest, again, which is the San Sebastian Marizal aquifer system, is represented here in yellow and in those uh, intercalations between yellow and green there. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. In this moment, uh, in this model, we have also considered some uh, faults 
uh, both from uh, regional uh, maps, but also from studies that uh, were developed locally used in, uh, using uh, seismic data. So this is sort of the final product for the 3D geological model. What we see in yellow here is this uh, one main aquifer which is exploited in the region for uh, groundwater supply. And then we have these other geological formations uh, in red, mostly granite, uh, crystalline type rock, so not very productive. And also some other sedimentary formations uh, which are much less productive than the San Sebastian aquifer, mainly because there is a dominance of uh, clay sediments in these uh, in these formations. So this is just an example of uh, one of the geological cross sections uh, that was taken from that study and how it appeared in the geological model. And as 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 you can see, the thickness of these aquifer it it can it varies a lot depending on which part of the sedimentary basin we are. So this, this sort of deeper, uh, thicker part is called this uh, Kamasari, Baixo de Kamasari, which is around the area where there is a large industrial complex uh, called the Kamasari Industrial Complex. So just uh, thinking then of uh, what our conceptual model uh, means. So what we have here then is a, is a diagram, a block diagram, of our uh, hydrogeological system. The main thing that we get from this model is the geometry and the volumes for the different units and therefore our uh, regional aquifer. And of course, it's going to be a simplification of the real hydrogeological system. But it, it has enough in there to allow us to uh, work with this regional assessment for of the groundwater uh, resources. If we zoom in into that uh, previous cross section that we saw, so here again in yellow we have the main aquifer system that uh, that is used for groundwater production, which is this uh, São Sebastião aquifer, and it has a characteristic that uh, we have a stack a stack of uh, sandstone layers interbedded by shales, so. Essentially, we have this sort of phreatic, unconfined aquifer, and then we have some sections which are semi-confined, and then we have a sequence of confined aquifers as we go deeper into the basin. And here we have the other geological formations that underlay, underlie the, the sandstones, and, but these are much less productive in terms of uh, uh, groundwater abstraction. And here we have this Salvador formation, which is another of these uh, low permeability units, much less productive again than the, than the San Sebastian aquifer. So what the San Sebastian aquifer is then is, uh, is essentially a sandstone formed by fine to medium sand, mostly what we would call a, a sort of clean sand, uh, mostly quartz, and with some finer material but that's the minority and it has different levels of consolidation depending where we are. This, this here to the right is just one large outcrop of this San Sebastian formation. And here we have a summary of uh, hydraulic properties that uh, we compiled from a number of studies uh, that were conducted in the past and uh, we can see that in terms of hydraulic conductivity it can actually be quite conductive up to 10 to the minus 4 depending where we are but as an average, it sits somewhere in the order of 110 to the minus five meters per second. And it's also quite a porous unit. So within this San Sebastian aquifer system, what we have is a large uh, phreatic aquifer, which is, as I mentioned before, is usually formed by the combination of the, the sandy sediments from the San Sebastian formation mainly, but also from the Marizal and the Barreiras group, uh, where these overlie the San Sebastian unit and locally also quaternary deposits. And then we're, what we have underneath that is, is basically a stack of uh, sandstone aquifers going from semi-confined to confined, containing fresh water and interbedded, as I mentioned before, by multiple layers of shale. And of course, uh, below the freshwater saltwater interface, then the groundwater becomes uh, brackish or saline. So there is a limit to the depth of the aquifer from which one can actually extract groundwater for consumption. What we can say for, for, uh, with certainty is that 
all the wells that uh, came to our knowledge down to that depth of about 420 meters. They are all uh, freshwater wells and the groundwater is actually has a very good quality as uh, we can see here. Here is just a brief comparison looking at the the average concentration for some of the groundwater constituents and these would be the potability standards in Brazil. So we can see that you know it's the concentrations of these uh, chemicals of concern are actually naturally quite low. In other words, it's very good quality groundwater. Before we move to the numerical modeling part, I'd like to show you some of the freshwater groundwater volume calculations that we did. And here we can also see that uh, within our study area, taking in the fresh brackish water interface into account, the São Sebastião Marizal Aquifer System represents about 80% of the potable groundwater resources in the region. On this second table, we have a few numbers that uh, illustrate how we calculate the permanent reserves or the volume of fresh water stored in this aquifer system. And uh, we can see also the contrast in effective porosity between the sandstone layers and the shale. Running a quick calculation, uh, we can also see that the permanent uh, reserves, this volume here, this number here calculated at the bottom, correspond to something like 460 times the annual recharge that uh, was estimated to these rivers. Another point to be noticed is that uh, based on the best estimate that we, we have uh, at the moment for this study area, the groundwater demand from these tube sort of deeper groundwater wells is in the order of uh, 21,000 cubic meters an hour. So this in relation to a total uh, renewable uh, resource for the study area of the order of 38,000 or for the São Sebastião Marizal Aquifer system of about 31,000 cubic meters an hour. The point I made earlier about uh, many wells not being known to the, to the state, to the authorities, is that most of these wells, if, if not all of them, they tend to be shallow wells, you know, dug by, by individuals or households, and uh, therefore they tend to abstract water mostly from the shallow aquifer. So in principle, we can, our assessment is that uh, most of the groundwater abstraction from the deeper confined aquifers is actually uh, represented within this number. Looking at the numerical model, numerical uh, flow and transport model. So one of the purposes of this model was to look at the current exploitation condition of the aquifer system and compare that to the uh, reserves that uh, uh, were calculated and check on the aquifer status in terms of exploitation. And once we had the model uh, built, and calibrated, then uh, we used it to simulate a couple of uh, scenarios considering the future demand, an increase in future demand of uh, groundwater. Here on the right side is just the, the sort of standard protocol or an, a numerical, a geological numerical modeling. So we just basically follow these steps until we reach the simulations. And as we will see there, we have some significant data deficiencies in this region, but for a first approach, we were able to actually use a lot of the information that, uh, that we collected to calibrate uh, this model. So in this model, we used uh, uh, the software fee flow, so the uh, finite element software with a triangular mesh. And this is a, a, a fairly large area. So this covers about 1,700 square kilometers. This area in red here on the westernmost section, we took that out from the numerical model simply because the aquifer here was so thin that uh, it, it caused uh, stability problems. And in terms of actual groundwater resources, it's not very significant. So the actual numerical model was run in this uh, bluish, in this blue uh, part. And what we see here is the mesh refinement in areas where we have rivers, some well fields, and also some uh, surface water reservoirs. In terms of the vertical domain, essentially, well, in the geological model, we saw that uh, we modeled out to 2,000 meters, which is the depth from the regional uh, geological sections and also the limits to the data that we had from the oil and gas uh, wells. What we did as well is we assumed the base of these uh, group of ilias, this geological formation group of ilias, which is in Equitart. We assumed that 
as the base of our numerical model. We kept some of these low permeability units here on the right, mainly to, to allow us to have lateral continuity in our uh, numerical layers. But uh, of course, in terms of uh, actual ground order potential, uh, these units are, are not relevant in comparison to the, to the main act first system. So what we represented in this uh, numerical uh, flow model were, well, the top uh, phreatic aquifer, which is a combination of São Sebastião, Barreiras and Marizal aquifers. We were able to simulate in total six aquifers, one which is the unconfined aquifer here at the top, and then five confined ones uh, to the bottom. And because we don't really have detailed information below about uh, four or 500 meters, then this unit, this the basal part of the São Sebastião aquifer system, we had to adopt, use a sort of average property here, even though we know it's, an, it's also an intercalation of uh, sandstone and shales. We, we don't have the geometry. So we used a, a sort of approximate uh, mean hydraulic conductivity value in this uh, bottom, bottom part. So this is what our model uh, looks in three dimensions in fee flow. In the final model, we had uh, 33 numerical layers. And this is mainly to give us a better discretization in the upper units which are the uh, units that uh, are most of interest for us, the sandstone and shale layers from the San Sebastian aquifer system. Here we see some of the boundary conditions that were used. Uh, so some constant heads where we have these water reservoirs and also in some of the limits where we, well, basically, this would basically be the sea, uh, the, the coast, the, the sea line, the coastline where the model intercepts the coastline. And also no flow, uh, well, no flow boundaries in the other sections and some fluid transfer boundaries here in the north and northwest parts to allow for a lateral flow from the other sedimentary areas that uh, exist here to this part, to, to the north and northwest of the model. For the recharge, uh, we did a we also, one of the, this is essentially one of the tasks that we had in this in this project was to assess the vulnerability intrinsic vulnerability of the aquifer systems we, we did that uh, using a, a methodology called uh, drastic which uh, some of you may be familiar with and this is the the sort of the recharge distribution that uh, resulted from that and because we had done that analysis we decided to use that distribution as input to our uh, numerical model. So, of course, if the recharge will vary significantly depending on which sector we, we are, but on average, it resulted in about 190 uh, millimeters per year. And this is just how it was uh, represented in, in fee flow. These are the tube wells or the abstraction wells that uh, we used to develop the model, uh, both in terms of their geological profiles, uh, so water levels and, and hydraulic conductivities where we were able to get that uh, parameter for recovery tests. So in total, we had represented in the model about 240 uh, of these abstraction wells. And then we had to select some of these wells to calibrate the model. And uh, we, we applied some criteria to selecting those wells. And in the end, uh, we used about 30 tubu wells for this calibration. About, well, four from the uh, from this uh, Marisa Wackfer, which occurs here in, at the main, the central part of the, the study area. These are shallow wells, mostly. And then from the main aquifer system, 27 wells from both unconfined aquifer and then from the confined layers. And well, this is where we got the, the data, uh, the data from. Here we can see a summary of the results from uh, the calibration uh, work that uh, was done using those 33 monitoring or those 33 uh, well points, monitoring points. The calibration was done initially manually and then in automated uh, uh, fashion using BEST, which was uh, set to vary both hydraulic conductivities and uh, recharge within a realistic uh, range of values based on our conceptual model. Here you can see a summary of the quantitative results and uh, we ended up with a uh, normalized root mean squared of about uh, 10%. And here on the right, we can see our um, calibration chart and also the K values that uh, were calibrated for the various aquifers. What we have here on these, from this line here, 
SSB livre, which is unconfined, down to SS for Lelios, which is shales. So these, all these uh, layers here represent the, the, the main aquifer system. Okay, so this is just a brief uh, illustration of uh, sensitivity analysis and what we see, the model is um, most sensitive to the uh, phreatic or unconfined aquifer and then recharge and then in second degree to the confined aquifer units. With the calibrated model, we simulated a couple of uh, scenarios of future demand, essentially using a plan from the state government, which projects water demand from 2010 to 2040 in liters per second and per municipality. So we, we just source the data for the municipalities which occur uh, within our study area and used these projections to simulate the, the use of groundwater to supply this, uh, this demand. So we had two scenarios, uh, one which was the then current scenario 2020 and a future scenario 2040. We had to adapt those projections to an approximate estimate, both in terms of human consumption and industrial consumption. And then we see an increase, you know, in those 20 years, there is a projected increase of about uh, 30% on average in groundwater abstraction in this case. Okay, this is the simulation for the current scenario for the regional uh, flow system. So, you know, we, we see, we just see the regional flow here from uh, northwest to southeast towards uh, the coast. And here where we have this large concentration of abstraction wells, which is, which corresponds roughly to this industrial complex that exists here, Polo Industrial Camassari. Then we see some, let's say, more significant drawdown. This in current terms. And then, so we see this here for the phreatic unconfined aquifer, and then looking at the confined aquifers. And, uh, and we see some, let's say, more marked drawdown areas in some of the confined aquifers, which are let's say, preferential targets for groundwater abstraction. And we see that again in the sort of deeper uh, confined aquifers. And then we did the same simulation for considering the year of 2040. And what we see basically is the, the sort of similar distribution of uh, drawdown areas, but it is just intensified. So greater drawdowns in these, in these areas. We are just moving here from aquifer confined one to confined two, three, four, and uh, to the deeper aquifer section. I'll just briefly touch on some of the limitations uh, on data availability. One of the main limitations really is sort of a consistent series of uh, water level readings over time. So most of the information that we have are from point readings for specific purposes, but they tend to be uh, separated. Most of them tend to be separated over time. So what we did in trying to compile uh, water levels that, uh, or hydraulic heads that we could use to calibrate the model uh, we tried to get readings from the closest periods possible, uh, which in this case meant a few years, and also during the same season of the year. I'll mention in the next slide, some of these limitations will actually be addressed on a second phase of the study that uh, we will be carrying out now in 2021. So in terms of conclusions, uh, the study results then indicated that, the, well, firstly, the pumping rates that are currently adopted by Embasa, the sanitation company, they are uh, sustainable in the long term. Embasa tends to have uh, wells which are fairly uh, spread apart and, and distant from, uh, from, from the main clusters that exist in the area, especially in the Kamasari industrial complex. Uh, and we see then some indication of overexploitation in some sectors of the study area, which are represented by those sort of accentuated uh, drawdown zones uh, that we saw in the simulation results. São Sebastião Marizal Aquifer System, it can, uh, it can, it can be used for, uh, for future groundwater abstraction and further groundwater abstraction, but uh, preferably in areas with less concentration of wells. Of course, these are sort of preliminary conclusions. One of our recommendations for the next phase of the study was actually, or is actually, to implement a monitoring uh, network of wells to be reading both static water levels over time and also dynamic uh, water levels in uh, selected pumping wells that are operated by 
uh, embassy. And this will be done by installing uh, sensors in these wells. And as we saw in the future scenario for 2040, if the same areas are used for this additional abstraction, what we are going to see will be then an increase in these or further accentuation in these uh, drawdown zones, which may uh, imply in the end uh, or, or may result in the end in the need of uh, having to drill deeper wells in case this overexploitation is, does take place. Our final slides is a number of uh, recommendations that uh, we made to Embaza. And if you look at this, uh, basically, it involves mostly uh, the implementation of a monitoring network, as I mentioned, both for water levels, abstraction rates, and also hydrochemistry. Uh, specifically in terms of developing a centralized database for compiling, validating, and using these data for uh, planning purposes. And of course, uh, with the increase, both in, the, in, in, in terms of amount and quality of data that is compiled, then we should uh, go back to both the conceptual and numerical model and improve these tools, which, as was said in the beginning, are meant to be, or the numerical model is meant to be to support the management of groundwater resources in the region. So I conclude here this presentation. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be uh, happy to answer them now. Thank you. Uh, so the first question we have here is uh, uh, from Beatrice. What is the inferred deposition environment to the San Sebastian sandstone? Is it known which type of uh, deposition environment generates uh, the best aquifer, considering the available porosity and the permeability uh, of it? Um, well, the first part of the question, the, uh, the depositional environment for this uh, particular unit uh, has been studied and uh, um, has been determined to be uh, uh, deposition by uh, rivers and also um, uh, deltaic uh, systems. So uh, sort of fluvial uh, deltaic uh, sedimentary uh, environment. Um, in terms of uh, which type of uh, depositional environment would generate the best aquifer, uh, I'm not sure there is a best uh, uh, type. Uh, it, it will depend a lot on, well, mostly on two things. Uh, one, uh, which is the amount of fines that end up, that end up uh, being uh, deposited uh, within these uh, sandstone packages. In our case, what we see is a sort of transition in environment over time uh, with some periods where coarser sediments uh, have been deposited, these, uh, these sand, which form these sandstone units, which are fairly clean in the sense of uh, not many fines, uh, fine sediments uh, within those sandstones. And, and that, that's one of the, the, the factors that uh, make them uh, good aquifers. And then periods where we had, let's say, uh, less, uh, lower energy, um, environments uh, where we, we have these uh, finds. I would say that uh, yeah, fluvial, uh, fluvial uh, environments uh, you know, are definitely good in the sense that they uh, deposit uh, uh, sort of coarser material that generates uh, a large porosity. And I would say that also uh, uh, eolic uh, uh, deposits um, would uh, constitute good uh, good aquifers as well. Um, uh, second question from uh, Luis. Uh, is there any study for the Barreiras formation for the south of Bahia, for example, Porto Seguro? Um, well, I'm not aware uh, of, uh, of, of such studies. Uh, you know, that's probably something that uh, uh, you know, you, you could sort of uh, check on the web and perhaps see if at uh, the university 
at uh, the Federal University of Bahia, they are doing something. Uh, Embasa has uh, certainly not uh, uh, conducted uh, uh, you know, this type of assessments in that uh, region. Um, as I mentioned, one of the uh, next stages to, well, the next stage, in fact, to the study will be uh, sort of a detail of what we have done so far, mostly by uh, implementing these monitoring scheme, which will give us um, additional and perhaps more uh, robust data to, to assess uh, the San Sebastian Aquifer uh, in the Reconcavo Basin. Um, okay, another question from Beatriz. How could you consider non-official data, illegal wells in your model? Because they might affect heavily the consumption. Uh, yes, uh, that's true. And that, that's in fact, that's always one of the concerns that we have in the sort of regional models. Uh, try to get a feel for what the, let's say, unknown uh, abstraction might be. Uh, from the discussions that we had, uh, both with Mbaza and, and also locally, uh, you know, with uh, people who live in the, in the region, the general impression that we get is that these, uh, let's say, non-registered wells, uh, they tend to be mostly shallow. So in our case, uh, our, you know, our current um, assessment is that it's mostly the, the shallow aquifer or the unconfined aquifer that uh, would be affected by uh, you know, this unregistered abstraction. Um, but having said that, in, in this next phase of the study, uh, one of the things that we are going to do, um, we, uh, we will select uh, three or four areas, uh, you know, polygons within the study area. And our intention is actually to do a sort of more detailed survey in these areas. Uh, trying to identify uh, non-registered wells. And, and from that, uh, we hope to get a, a better uh, estimate for you know, what, that, what those rates uh, might be. But I would say in, in, in our case, if we would really consider this, uh, we would mostly be putting wells in the sort of shallow uh, wells, abstracting uh, water from the Upper Eckford. Another way to look at this, and, and, and it goes back to the, the importance of um, having this monitoring system in place, is that uh, you know if 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 there is a lot of uh, unregistered abstraction in some area, and we have some monitoring points, uh, one of the things that we might see is actually a localized. Uh, 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 fall or, or a localized drawdown in these uh, monitored water levels. Uh, and that perhaps could give us an indication of some, you know, of a situation like that. And, 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 and again, that sort of reinforces the importance of uh, monitoring uh, these uh, uh, regional systems. Um, Okay, another question, if we can consider the aquifer analog to a oil reservoir. Um, well, I would say that uh, they, are certainly, uh, they are certainly comparable. I mean, uh, the difference is, is really uh, the fluid. So uh, of course, oil will behave, you know, due to its intrinsic uh, prop, uh, physical properties, it's going to behave differently in the, in the, um, uh, in the formation than water does. And there is also the, the, the aspect of depth. Uh, usually uh, you know, oil is, is at much deeper uh, depths. Um, we, our, our uh, original team here at uh, Water Services, we came from uh, Schlumberger which is an oil services company. 
and uh, and I can say that a lot of the technologies that are used in the in the oil sir in the oil field uh, they they are very applicable to investigating um, aquifers. The main limitation being that you know the tools that are used in the oil industry they tend to to be at a price level that is not compatible, uh, let's say, with, uh, with the water industry. But, but, but yes, I mean, even, even numerical modeling tools that uh, are used for uh, modeling oil reservoirs, uh, we have used uh, those in the past for um, modeling uh, aquifers. So, so, you know, it's, it, they are very comparable you know, in terms of how we approach the, the characterization. So, okay, now we have a question from Ana in Portuguese. So uh, one of the recommendations was to implement a system of uh, hydrogeological uh, management. Okay, so uh, how, how would that be? So th there, there are two aspects to that. One's, one uh, which is, uh, the managing of data, so how you collect and manage and uh, and store data, uh, and that's something that uh, we have been doing in in, in various projects uh, using uh, using a software that I mentioned in the beginning uh, called the Hydrogeoanalyst, uh, which is basically a database uh, with a graphic interface that uh, you know facilitates. Uh, not only the, the storing uh, and validation of the data, but also uh, access and, and use of it. So that's that's one aspect. Uh, um, the other aspect is actually making use of that data. And, and when we say that a numerical model could be a tool to support uh, act for management, um, what do we mean by that is, you know, is that, um, you can actually test different uh, scenarios, uh, add wells in, in, in certain aquifer levels or in certain areas uh, and see what sort of impact that uh, is going to have or that uh, in uh, nearby uh, wells, uh, for example. Uh, what do we hope with this kind of study eventually is that the state uh, agencies which are responsible for permitting uh, um, new wells, that they actually not only have access to a tool like this, uh, a numerical model, a numerical hydrogeological model, but they, that they can actually use that when they are um, uh, evaluating requests for the drilling of uh, new wells in you know whatever region it is what we see nowadays is that the criteria is very kind of random some you know some some agencies will say oh you you must have a radius you must have a distance from the closest well of a thousand meters or two thousand meters or 500 meters but that's that's really random uh, we we understand that uh, you know using tools like the one we've shown here, and actually carrying out uh, uh, investigations and implementing these monitoring systems, which, in relative terms, they are fairly cheap. Uh, you know, we can implement a monitoring system probably by the cost of one uh, deeper uh, well. Um, so that's the intention. The intention is to sort of spread the idea that. Uh, uh, by collecting good data and, and storing that and making use of it using tools such as numerical models, uh, aquifer management can be uh, improved uh, a lot. Okay. So, um, I believe that's it. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, if, if uh, anyone another question uh, otherwise you can always uh, email us as well uh, if you have something specific in mind and um, yeah but if not for today then uh, I'll 
like to thank you uh, again uh, for your time and uh, yeah, hope to see you uh, back in one of uh, our, our next uh, webinars or courses. Thank you. We hope you enjoy it. And this webinar will be on the Water Services and Technologies YouTube, YouTube channel in the coming days. We will let every, everyone know about it uh, by email. Uh, Water Services, thanks everyone again for interest and participation. And we look forward to seeing you at our next events. Great day and good rest of the week for everyone.